SPRI's monthly discussion of international affairs. I'm Ron Granary, Executive Director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West, your host and moderator of tonight's discussion. All of us at FPRI, thank you for joining us today, live and archived on the internet, and live this evening on April 11th, 2018, at the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Mixing religion and politics may be dangerous in family conversations, but it is unavoidable in the construction of state legitimacy. Religious authority can be a powerful ally for any leader and a dangerous enemy as well. Whether a leader sincerely believes himself or herself is another matter and may be beside the point. Machiavelli stated it most plainly when he wrote in The Prince that, quote, it is not necessary for a prince to have all the qualities of a faithful man but it, is, but it is indeed necessary to appear to have them. One of Machiavelli's greatest disciples, Napoleon Bonaparte, himself deeply skeptical, even cynical about religious faith, recognized the importance of respecting and cultivating the faith of his subjects to encourage public order. As he is oft quoted as having said, men who do not believe in God, one does not govern them, one shoots them. Authoritarian rulers can never be too careful about how they handle religious authorities, and Saddam Hussein was no different. Although he rose to power with the secular nationalist Ba'ath Party in Iraq, once he established himself as president, Saddam embarked on a long program to co-opt Islam in the service of his vision for a greater Iraq. Drawing on Ba'athist and other thinkers who emphasized Islam as an Arab religion and manipulating concepts such as the Ummah, to emphasize its meaning as an Arab community rather than an international, transnational community of Muslims, Saddam embarked on a faith campaign that was not Islamist in a commonly accepted sense, but which linked the faith to loyalty to Saddam and the state. His regime subsidized reliable authorities and institutions, sponsored international conferences, and even founded the Saddam University for Islamic Studies. By the time his regime fell, in response to the American invasion of Iraq 15 years ago, Saddam had succeeded in remaking the religious institutions of Iraq in ways outsiders never did quite understand. The failure of American war planners to see how Saddam's departure would leave those institutions ripe for takeover by radicals and well positioned to thwart the post-war government helped unleash the insurgency that made a mockery of Washington's efforts to portray toppled statues and mission accomplished banners as heralds of a new dawn in the Middle East. Our guest tonight, Dr. Samuel Helfont, has just published a book that analyzes not only how Saddam used religion to build the legitimacy of his regime, but also how Iraq's particular mixture of religion and politics shaped the Iraqi response to the American invasion and the insurgency that followed. Playing on a line in the Quran, Helfont's compulsion in religion offers deeper historical understanding of the process and its results, laying bare both the, com the complex dance between regime and religious institutions and how they both had an interest in downplaying the interpenetration of the two during Saddam's time. As Helfont puts it, the regime was never concerned with religious knowledge as much as it was with political loyalty. But religious institutions existed as, an, as apparently distinct from the state, but not quite distinct from the state. As he concludes the book, the idea that an independent, cohesive Iraqi civil society existed was based on a misconception about how the Ba'athists ruled the country. It was an illusion caused by Ba'athification. And the Americans and other outsiders misunderstood this at their peril. But tonight we have somebody who does understand it, and he's going to help us to understand it as well. So how did Saddam Hussein use religion to support his regime? How did religious institutions and individuals respond to Saddam's policies? How did their relationship shape the nature and intensity of the post-war insurgency? These questions, and yours, will guide us in conversation with our guest, Dr. Samuel Helfont. Dr. Samuel Helfont, senior fellow with FPRI's program on the Middle East, is also a postdoctoral lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania's Interdisciplinary International Relations Program. An officer in the US Naval Reserve, he holds a PhD 
from Princeton University's Near Eastern Studies Department, where he wrote the dissertation upon which compulsion in religion is based, which drew on newly available Ba'ath Party and Iraqi state records. His work has been published in the Middle East Journal, Foreign Affairs, Orbis, and the New Republic, among others. Um, and a brilliant analyst of Iraqi history and politics and an especially valued member of the FPRI scholarly family. We are delighted to have him with us tonight. Welcome, Samuel Halfat. So Sam, I want to start with a big question to start us off. What is Baathism okay. <laughs> and, and how did the Baath Party come to rule Iraq? Okay, so uh, Baathism is a, uh, the word Baath means renewal and it was um, a typical movement of sort of 1930s, 1940s, not just in the Middle East but uh, across uh, the Western world too, it's sort of uh, trying to, you know, newly educated people trying to find their way in the world. Uh, Baathism was founded actually by, in Syria, uh, the leading intellectual, there was a few different sources, but the leading intellectual, the most important for the Iraqi branch at least, uh, was actually a Christian named uh, Michel Aflac, and uh, he was from Damascus. He goes to France to the Sorbonne, studies, uh, he's a leftist. Uh, when he goes to the Sorbonne, uh, he engages with all sorts of communist and nationalist uh, ideas in Europe in the 1930s. Uh, has a falling out with the communists because uh, the French Communist Party supports the occupation, the, uh, the, the colonization of, of Syria, which he doesn't like. Uh, and so he turns uh, nationalist, but he maintains this sort of socialism, which is a uh, mix that you may have heard of before in other places. Uh, so he's very much uh, a romantic thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and he comes up with an idea of Arab nationalism, which is uh, their own followers, the Ba'athist followers, call it a type of uh, a radical Arab nationalism and not, uh, not simply Arab nationals that they want uh, a state uh, in the name of the Arab nation or you know, something like that, but a, a radical version of it, right? Uh, they were self-described um, radicals who wanted to uh, re revolutionary change, not just of the political system, of, but of uh, society, Arab society, uh, itself. Um, so they rise in Syria, uh, but they soon spread off into different parts of the Middle East. They, they make their way into Iraq in, um, uh, in the early 1950s, and uh, they gain a foothold among um, the sort of you know, more extreme nationalists, right? There are some other nationalist parties in, in Iraq, but they, they are on uh, the more extreme uh, side. Um, and they take part in rough and tumble politics uh, throughout the 1950s. The Iraq is a very, uh, uh, not very stable place. There's a number of coups. Mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein gets mm -hmm. involved in the party at this, at this point in the 1950s. He actually tries to assassinate uh, one of the leaders of Iraq and has to flee the country uh, because of that. Um, where, does, where does Saddam go when, when he's in exile? Where, where does an Iraqi so he, radical go? He, well, first he... It's an it's a interesting story, which he actually repeats several times when he's in power, because this is his part of it. You know, he's shot in the leg, and he's in a taxi cab, and he's going away from Baghdad, and he has to dig out a, a, a bullet from his leg with a knife, and then he swims across the Tigris, which he reenacts several times. You can see, you know, if you just Google Saddam swimming across the Tigris, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, he, he liked to reenact this, you know, on anniversaries mm -hmm. of it. And so he escaped up into Syria, and then eventually into, into Egypt. Into Egypt. Yeah, under, under Nasser. And, um, and related to this, so would you say, what's the connection between Ba'athism in Iraq versus in Syria, in Egypt, in other places? Were they, did they think of themselves as part of the same movement or were they distinctly, distinct national strands? So at first they thought of themselves as the same movement, as there's one Arab world and they're all part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in Syria and in, uh, and in Iraq. Uh, but they had a, a bit of a falling out among the different factions in Syria. They split, and then you have two competing Ba'ath parties, which both complain. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they both claim to be the Ba'ath party, mm -hmm. right? And one is in Baghdad, and one is in Syria. Michel Aflac actually comes to the Iraqi version, so he's he's in he's in Iraq. In Egypt, they never they had some Ba'athists in Egypt, but the, Nasser wasn't a Ba'athist. Mm -hmm. uh, and but they did see themselves as sort of 
you know, in solidarity. Uh, so there was this love-hate relationship between all of them because mm -hmm. they all sort of wanted to unite right. together. That's right. what their ideology said they should do. But uh, for practical reasons, uh, they never quite did it. And what was, I mean, I, I do think it's interesting that Aflac is a, is a Christian, so he's yeah. thinking of Arab nationalism. What was, you know, before Saddam becomes president of Iraq, what was the, the Ba'athist uh, attitude towards Islam as religion, or as to religion generally? So this is something that I guess was uh, not understood very well by a lot of people, uh, a lot of experts, I would say, even in, in the West. Um, so Aflac, even though he was a Christian, he wrote a lot of... Uh, a lot about Islam, and he really liked Islam. Mm -hmm. And he had this idea that not just him, but other Arab nationalists had this idea too, and especially other Arab nationalists who were Christians had this idea that um, Islam and Arab nationalism were sort of linked together. They were sort of the same civilization. So that a Christian, even though they were a Christian, they were still somehow part of this broader uh, Islamic uh, civilization. Uh, and they spoke really highly of Muhammad. They call him the Arab prophet, not the uh, Muslim prophet. The Muslim prophet. Um, and there are some, there's some evidence in the early, very early Islamic sources that Islam did see itself as a Arab religion prior to sort of universalizing. Um, that's not the mainstream view of Islam, of course, but the Arab nationalists sort of cling on to these mm -hmm. sources um, and, and claim that this is Aflac. There's even some uh, evidence that he may have converted at some point. Uh, in the early 1980s, mm -hmm. although most of this evidence comes after he died. Uh, so in these kind of regimes, you know, people are sometimes, con you know. They, are, they uh, are converted. Yeah, they are converted or, you know. So, so Aflac lived long enough to see Saddam Hussein become president of Iraq. That's right. Uh, until the, so Aflac was actually in charge of the Ba'ath Party until the late 80s uh -huh. uh, when he passes away. It was a kind of figurehead position, but now that we have all these sources, we can see he actually does take part in... Uh, some of the debates and speaks up uh, on, on issues, um, and so you know we can. Saddam seems to take what he's saying seriously, even though Saddam certainly has the last word. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and then when Aflac dies, Saddam takes over not just as in charge of Iraq, but the whole, the whole Ba'ath thing. And did did uh, uh, Ba'athism or Aflac in particular, or, or Ba'athism in general, did it have an opinion on the sectarian difference between Shia and Sunni? So the official, uh, the official position was no. There was no difference. We're all just Arabs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sectarian um, is a kind of reactionary, old way of looking at it that maybe um, Islamists or people they don't like uh, look at it that way. I mean, Aflac himself wasn't, wasn't even a Muslim, so forget Sunni Shi. I mean, he was a Christian, right? But um, if you think of some of the other Ba'athists, like Assad's in... Uh, in Syria, they're Ba'athist, and they are not Sunnis, right? So right. They're, they're Alawi, which is a sort of extreme version of Shiism. Uh, and the founders, the first Ba'athists in Iraq, actually, um, the first uh, Secretary General of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party was a Shi as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so eventually it does become more Sunni, but this has probably more to do with just who took over in the party and where they were from. Mm -hmm. So Saddam and his fa sort of uh, family takes over the party in the late 1960s, um, and they're from a Sunni region of Tikrit, and they appoint people who are from their town, their own kinsmen, people they know, people they have tribal relationships with, disproportionately. So the party becomes disproportionately Sunni, um, not necessarily because they were pro-Sunni, that just happens to be where they were from. And so, uh, so, that, so there's, nothing, there's nothing in Ba'athism that, sa that, that says one way or another Sunni Shia, because that, all that stuff should be less important than Arab unity. Yes, certainly. Now, there are some things in Ba'athism. Ba'athism takes the standard, um, if you learn about Islam, if you Google Islam 101, you'll get a, a narrative about Islam, which is generally a Sunni narrative, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's Muhammad, and there's four caliphs after him, and they go to Damascus, and then they go to Baghdad, oh, this whole, you know, basic history of Islam uh, that you would find on Wikipedia or, or wherever else, uh, is basically a Sunni narrative, and the Ba'athists sort of adopt this generic, uh, what they consider to be a generic form of Islam, which has certain Sunni biases, mm -hmm. for sure. But uh, they really try to downplay um, Sunni or Shi uh, mm -hmm. differences and just looked on ethnic, uh, ethnic identity as being the most important. So um, on his way to becoming president of Iraq, did Saddam Hussein have any uh, 
particular or idiosyncratic ideas about religion, or would you consider he was sort of a mainstream Baathist when it came to religious I, questions? I think he was pretty much a mainstream Baathist uh, when, when he's coming to power. Now, when he gets in power, as these dictators do, they, they sometimes get a little bit crazy. Um, you know, I had a student actually say to me that you can really tell how you know, authoritarian or totalitarian regime is by the, the outfits that they wear. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, the, the least, you know, when people are less inclined to tell you that, you know, listen, sir, that's a little bit nutty what you're wearing, you know, uh, you might want to put on a regular suit, then you know that things aren't going well and he's not getting the right <laughs> advice. And Saddam uh, had a little bit of that and uh, he started doing some, uh, some things with religion uh, in the 1990s which were a little bit crazy, mm -hmm. uh, which were certainly outside the mainstream of, uh, Normal. He, he, he had huge statues made of his hands holding swords. He had huge statues of his hands. He, he created a Quran uh, that was written in his own blood. Uh, it took uh, a couple years of him sitting with a nurse and this calligrapher, and they would take you know two pints or whatever at a time and mix it and, uh, and write this very ornate blood Quran. It's uh, apparently the calligrapher lives in Virginia now. <laughs> but uh, he's not talking to anybody. That's, that must be a very interesting business model. Yeah. <laughs> And they, uh, they put this Quran in uh, something they called the Mother of All Battles Mosque, which if you remember in the 1991 Gulf War, this was the Mother of All Battles, according to Saddam. And this mosque uh, is still, I believe, the biggest Sunni mosque in, uh, in Baghdad. It's not called the Mother of All Battles Mosque anymore. It's called the Mother of All Villages Mosque, which is another name for Mecca. But the minarets, it has eight minarets of this mosque. And of the eight minarets, there's four AK-47s and four Scud missiles. Um, and so they had this blood Quran on display in there. Um, and, and so these ideas were a little bit, you know, outside the mainstream, we, you, might, you might say. I mean, that, that, that leaves me speechless for just a moment. Okay, but, let's, but, but to come back to something to, uh, something to talk about is, is that in the beginning of your book, you, uh, you make a comparison between um, how Saddam Hussein decides to deal with religion and the way that other authoritarian regimes, um, Soviet Union, Communist China, um, uh, have dealt with religion. And I, um, I want to talk about that comparison. But before we talk specifically about that comparison in an academic sense, I am curious, did Saddam think of, or do, in your research did you find, did he, did he draw on examples of how other states or other societies used religion in the development of his faith campaign, in the development of his policies towards religion, or did they, did they just come from his, his own reading of his political interests? Yeah, so it's interesting. I never, I never actually came across him uh, drawing on other, mm -hmm. especially non-Muslim mm -hmm. or non-Arab uh, mm -hmm. leaders. Um, he did have a lot of parallels with them, but I think it was a structural mm -hmm. parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the structural parallel is that if you are an authoritarian leader, as you said in your very <laughs> good uh, introduction, you, you have religion is a tricky issue. On one hand, it could be great if everyone thinks that listening to you is a in line with their religion, that's really powerful stuff. Uh, on the other hand, uh, religion has been the thing that, um, the one thing really, that's been able to stand up to authoritarianism around the world, right? I mean, think of, uh, you know, from Poland in, at the end of the Cold War, right? You know, you have the Catholic Church there. Um, you know, Hitler wasn't able to break the, the, either, and he complains about this, you know, he's not able to break the, the, either the Catholic or the Protestant churches. The Soviet Union wasn't able to do it, right? They still had, by the 1950s, 60s, they had more people applying for priesthood than they had spots at the seminary, even though being a priest in the Soviet Union was not a very uh, good life. Um, even in places like China, they had the same issues, right? Um, they've had all sorts of mass construction projects in China where they get into trouble is when they build dams that cover uh, shrines or, or graveyards of, of their ancestors, then you get actually people protesting. Mm -hmm. Their farm fields, everything else doesn't matter, but uh, you know, shrines to their ancestors they get very upset about. So um, religion is on one hand something very powerful and useful for an authoritarian ruler, and on the other hand it's uh, something very dangerous. So they all have to sort of play within this dichotomy, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them end up doing the same thing, which is finding some people uh, who they can represent as legitimate religious leaders who will say all the, do all the right things. And they try to use these people to replace the sort of uh, indigenous, uh, pre-existing religious landscape. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we, we've, you and I have talked before about uh, how uh, different religions that are, that are structured differently can make it easier or harder for a uh, political regime to control them. Right? And so I'm curious about specifically how does Islam fit in with efforts to, uh, to link it to the state, right? Especially Sunni Islam is not hierarchical. So how does, how does a, uh, how did S Saddam uh, link the state and religion, or so mosque and state in, in Iraq, even in the absence of you know, single clear religious hierarchies? So um, because he was a Baathist, he tried to have one religious policy for doing this across the board. And mm -hmm. he just said, we're just dealing with Islam here, mm -hmm. right? We don't worry about sectarian difference. Uh, in practice, uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam are very different on this regard. Mm -hmm. The Sunnis are sort of easy. They're kind of pushovers uh, because they don't have any money. Um, in Shiism, there's a special tax uh, where um, everyone pays a special tax to a religious leader and this religious, these religious leaders pass it up through a very strict hierarchy, and then it gets redistributed into their shrines, and they have all these endowments. So they actually control, uh, the Iraqi Shi religious leaders control a lot of money, I mean, in the billions of dollars. Um, and so it's very difficult for the state to sort of intervene because they have their own, mm -hmm. uh, their own money, their own hierarchies, uh, their own sort of real senses of authority. Uh, Sunni Islam is not like that. Sunni Islam is kind of like Protestantism out in you know, mm -hmm. the countryside of Pennsylvania. Everyone mm -hmm. who wants a church just kind of opens one and uh, you know, then you get somebody to give up and give the, the, you know, the sermon like and then the that's preacher, it. As long as he's a good enough preacher to attract right. a crowd. Yeah, so that was typically how it was done. Of course, Saddam didn't like that and he wanted to, and eventually they do, you know, start appointing their own preachers. But um, they're much easier to co-op because um, you, can, um, you, know, you can just pay them mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, money to do it, right? right? And also because there's no hierarchy, uh, you know, you can sort of appoint people, right? Mm -hmm. Versus if there's a hierarchy, and also the, in, in the Shia Islam, they have seminaries, very important seminaries, which you can't just do away with. I mean, these are very important to Shia Islam. Um, it's kind of like the Vatican or something like that, right? right. You can't just do away with it, um, even if you don't like it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you just try to change the staff. You try to change the staff, but it takes a, it takes a, long, mm -hmm. a long time, and it's much more difficult to manipulate. So. In theory, they had one religious policy. On, in practice, they really had two uh, for each. And of course, the, the, the Sunni Shia problem becomes potentially more explosive during the Iran Iraq War if Iran is Shiite and is the enemy. And so, how did the Iran Iraq War fit in with Saddam Hussein's efforts to use religion to uh, shore up his regime? Well, it was a kind of catalyst, right? Um, Saddam gets a lot of the blame, rightly so for the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, people in the West don't really know much about the Iran-Iraq War, but it's a real shame because uh, it's the largest war between two third world countries ever. Um, and it has, you know, a million people are killed and there's air war and there's sea war and there's weapons of mass destruction used. It goes on, it's just this really destructive, uh, seminal event uh, in Middle Eastern history uh, and no one knows anything about it. Uh, but how it starts, uh, which I started by saying Saddam gets a lot of the blame, right. which uh, usually after you say that is, means that he shouldn't get as much as he does, right? Uh, Saddam and the former regime in Iran had, had a, an agreement mm -hmm. that says, uh, you know, we won't mess with you and you won't mess with us, mm -hmm. right? right? Now, when there's a revolution, Khomeini doesn't, in, in Iran, Islamic revolution, they don't recognize these agreements. And they look over at Iraq and they say, well, that country has... 60% Shis and a Sunni ruler that's secular, that's ripe for us getting in there and, and causing problems. So they do. They, they start sending over people, they start infiltrating, and they, there's some sort of uprisings um, in the late 70s and early 80s in, in Iraq, which is one of the reasons that Saddam uh, launches the war. That being said, though, mm -hmm. um, for the most part, the Shis in Iraq are very different than the Shis in Iran. Uh, for a number of different reasons. One, of course, they're Arabs and versus they're you know, Persians in Iran. Two, because uh, the Shis in Iran had been Shis for a lot longer. The Shis in Iraq actually only convert to Shiism, convert or become Shis uh, in, in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, so they're much newer. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the same institutions. They're not connected to the state. Uh, and they stay mostly loyal. So this really bloody war where you know, Saddam Hussein is just throwing his soldiers at the Iranians and the Iranians are throwing their soldiers back. 
uh, most of the soldiers that he's throwing are, I mean, they're almost all Shis, almost all the foot soldiers are Shis, and they stay loyal the whole time. Um, and so it drives Saddam to, in a sort of defensive way, to try to make sure that they stay loyal. Mm -hmm. So he needs to have a good religious policy. Uh, and he, you know, he wants to show that the Ba'athists aren't uh, infidels and that they do believe in God and they actually have a better version of Islam than the, uh, you know, than, than the Persians uh, right. across the way because they're Arabs and Arabs, of course, know Islam better Islam. than Persians according to Arab nationalists. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not really a, an issue of sectarianism, it's more of him just sort of trying to protect himself. He's also trying to protect himself from the Sunnis as well, the mm -hmm. Sunni Islamists, who are also, I mean, I think we look at this through sectarian lenses, but uh, there was a lot of Sunni Islamists in the Muslim Brotherhood who also um, liked this idea of Islamic revolution and liked Khomeini mm -hmm. and supported Khomeini. Uh, so the Iraqi Muslim Brotherhood actually supported uh, Khomeini against Saddam, and they spent you know, they were just as worried, not as worried, but they were very worried about these Sunni Islamists too. They didn't, they weren't worried about um, Sunnis or Shis, they were worried about uh, Islamist revolutionaries. Good. Well, this is, the, that, that's good, because that's the question I wanted to get to as the, as, the, as the audience warms up to start hitting you with questions. I, yeah. um, can you say something about um, uh, the distinction between sort of Saddam's efforts to link religion to his state and Islamism, right? They're not the same thing, that's right. and yet how exactly are they not the same thing? Yes, so, um, you know, in the same time that Aflac is coming up with these ideas, um, where he's mixing thoughts of Islam, thoughts of Arab nationalism, uh, there are other uh, intellectuals and thinkers, uh, you know, some of them very closely related, uh, thought-wise, coming up with a different idea, which mm -hmm. is called Islamism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the Islamists, oftentimes there's a lot of overlap. It's, a lot of times Islamists also like Arab nationalism, but they just consider Islamism to be just, uh, Islam to be more important, right? Mm -hmm. Islam is the primary marker of their identity. Uh, because of that, they uh, focus on things like piety mm -hmm. uh, much more than, um, than uh, Arab nationalists do. And most importantly, they think that the state should be based on Islamic law. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Ba'athists reject this, right? The Ba'athists say, no, we're good Muslims, but we don't think the state should be based on Islamic law. Those are kind of old ideas that we've got beyond. Um, so in many ways, they're very similar, but in other ways, they're, um, you know, uh, they're competing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they both like, yes, they both like Islam. This is sort of misunderstood, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you say, oh, the secular nas uh, nationalist versus the Islamist, and the secular nationalists don't like Islam, and Islamists do. That's not true. These, both of them like Islam, and both of them like Arab nationalism. They just put them somewhere different on their hierarchy of what's important, uh, and they try to create a state based on different Ideas. You know, this this actually leads me to a question I was I was wondering about that you know it, just as as uh, Baathism was both nationalist but also had sort of transnational aspirations, the role of an organization like the Muslim Brotherhood, which also has transnational uh, uh, ambitions, but there are local branches. Yes. And um, you know, does the Muslim Brotherhood? So if we think of the Muslim Brotherhood as a representative of Islamism in Iraq, in Egypt and other places, do they work with each other, um, or do they think of themselves as you know that I'm you know am I am I an am I an Iraqi Islamist or an Iraqi an Iraqi Islamist? So, I, <laughs> an Islamist Iraqi or an Iraqi yeah, Islamist. Right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they you know they, they change over time. Uh, there was a sort of founding idea, and this is one of the things that they would fight with the nationalists about. Mm -hmm. The Islamists said, no, we have to be. You know, it, can't, it comes out of pan-Islam, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So at least there was a founding idea, which I'm not sure if it still exists as much today, but there was a founding idea that uh, we need to create a larger Islamic unity, right? Political entity based on Islamic unity, which would include Pakistan and, you know, Indonesia and, and the Arab world and whatnot. And the Arabs say, no, the Arab nationals say, no, it has to be Arab, you know, not Islamic. And they would fight over, over that, right? Which one to prioritize? Um, you know, the bat, like the same thing happened with both of these movements, right? They start off with these high ideals. Um, you know, by the time Saddam's in the end, uh, towards the end of his regime, he's paying lip service towards this pan-Arab nationalism, but really he's focused on Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood is the sort of same way. Mm -hmm. um, they were founded on this idea of pan-Islam. They were going to rebuild a caliphate uh, after the fall of the, the Ottoman Empire. 
Um, but in practice, you know, as the 20th century winds on, you know, the connections between the different branches are, uh, are attenuated. Gotcha. So uh, one more question for me, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. So uh, to, to help us to pivot a little bit, what was the state of uh, religious institutions in Iraq uh, at the time of the American invasion in 2003? When you say that the Americans didn't understand what was going on in Iraq, what didn't we understand? So um, the way that the Ba'athists did this, and they were very savvy, um, was they wanted to make it look as if they don't have control. Because then when people you know, spontaneously go out into the street to you know, uh, support the regime, they're not doing it because you've made them do it, right? Uh, and so it was the same thing with, with religion, right? You want the religious leaders to look like they are independently saying the right thing, right? And so that's the sort of system they put in place. And um, it worked, I think, to some extent. And in the West, there was this idea that the, the regime had simply lost control, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't in control, uh, especially of religious uh, institutions. So uh, Iraq was able, Saddam was able to use these religious institutions, um, like mosques and seminaries and universities and things like that, um, to carry out his policies uh, and to say the right things. But it's because he had very tightly controlled them. So he sort of transformed them or even like weaponized them, you could say, right? Um, but very tightly mm -hmm. controlled. Um, the United States and other, not just in the government, but even academics who were looking at, at this, uh, at Iraq during this period in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, said no, Saddam had, had, didn't really have control of these, especially in the Shi regions, right? Uh, you know, these were basically self-governing regions at this point, right? Uh, and they designed, the Americans designed the, the plan to take over Iraq based on those assumptions, right? Um, so, I mean, at first there was a, uh, a restriction on entering or dealing with any religious institution. You couldn't go near them, right? Mm -hmm. This was on the no-hit list. But then they were getting fired at from all these religious institutions that they made the wake up to Baghdad. So they had to, they had to go all the way to the White House to change it right away. Uh, and then when they occupied the country, you know, they had to put the different forces of the coalition in different places, right? So in, in the Shi areas, the heavily, the, the, uh, they thought, well, you know, th those areas have been pretty calm. Uh, they have these Shi leaders there, these ayatollahs. They seem to have things under control, and it's not the state that's uh, controlling them. So they must be sort of self-governing. Mm -hmm. So these sort of radical elements that emerge after 2003, like if you've heard of the Sadrists or various Iranians that come in, um, the assumption of war planner seems to have been that those elements weren't being kept out by the regime, but by a sort of self-governing group of, of religious leaders. So they said this will remain, if we get rid of the regime, that's not going to change anything, and uh, we don't have to worry about these areas. So they put different coalition partners there, um, like they put the Spanish and the Italians there, who didn't have a rule, they had rules of engagement, which wouldn't even allow them to fight if they had to, right? I mean, they were just kind of there for show. Uh, to be part of the coalition Super, of the willing. The coalition of the willing, yeah. that's right. Um, and then these, you know, what we now know is that, you know, actually Saddam uh, and the Ba'athist regime was exerting a lot of control, and it was the regime, not, you know, that was keeping, they were in every mosque, you know, and they were uh, keeping out these actors like the Sadrists and the Iranians. Um, and once they leave, they create a huge vacuum. Mm -hmm. And it's filled by various extremist actors who are still, really a lot of them running Iraq today. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, the rest of the story you guys know. These, you know, they launch a war against the Sunnis and the Sunni mosques are taken over by uh, extremists who are, you know, um, anytime you have a vacuum like this, the most extreme voices and most extreme actors are gonna come in because they shoot the non-extreme actors, right? They just kill them. Um, so, you know, if you're a moderate, that's not, it's not gonna... It's tough, it's tough it's to be tough, a moderate. It's tough to be a moderate, true. right? Uh, um, and so you have these sort of weaponized institutions which have been politicized. Iraqis were used to going there to get political advice, to, uh, to get education, for, mm -hmm. um, you know, for all sorts of services. Uh, and they continue going to the mosques. The mosques have been transformed into centers of, of not just religious life, but political, educational, security uh, institutions of the country. Um, and then they are taken over uh, right after, uh, because there's a huge vacuum. So there's a huge vacuum. So I want to give the audience a chance to participate. And uh, as we do here at Geopolitics with Granary, the tradition is the first question goes to someone who is either here for the first time or who has never asked a question before. Who wants to be brave enough 
to raise their hand. <laughs> ah, there we go. The, wait, the microphone will come to you. See, I knew that would motivate somebody. Thank you. Go right ahead. My, my question is a, a simple one. What lessons do we take from this? And how do you, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight and however long you studied this, you, you acknowledge that at the time of the invasion, neither people in the government or academics really um, had really looked at the dangers of what, what, what was likely to happen. So what do we do with this information now? Can, can we really learn from it? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's not much, you, well, there's a couple of things that you can learn from this, which, uh, and, and there are both of the, the two things I think are age old lessons, which we always have to relearn and relearn and relearn. Uh, one is that these regimes uh, are never just ruling through violence. They're always ruling through some sort of popular mechanisms, popular will. They have some support in the population, right? right. Of course, it's hard to know that because afterwards, everybody was part of the resistance afterwards, right? Uh, but, you know, that's not how regimes like this function. Uh, the second thing, and I think um, is, is just a bit of humility about what you can and cannot know. Right, so what happens between, uh, if you look at some of the things in say the late 1990s, before war was on the table, uh, they didn't know uh, what was going on in Iraq, but they were sort of cognizant of that. If you look at some of the war plans, they had exercises and things like that. What happens if we have to take over Iraq? What will we do? And they're really starting to debate among themselves, well, we don't really know this information. This is a lot of things we don't know. Uh, and you know, we'll have to figure this out, and we have to acknowledge that this is based on an assumption, so we need a backup plan and all this sort of stuff. Uh, by 2003, all that seems to have just gone away. I mean, they were just convinced that they had it right, and uh, you know, there was no real backup plan. It was, the, the humility had, had sort of dropped off, uh, off the table, and that's uh, very dangerous. Um, Gripped within uh, uh, a terrible certainty can yeah. be very dangerous. Um, as we wait for the next question from the audience, I want to throw this at you because you, you've hinted at this early in this conversation and I want to make it more explicit. Is Do you think that uh, secular, that, that political analysts in secular societies in the West uh, simply have a blind spot when it comes to appreciating the importance of religious belief? Because if we don't believe anything, we don't think anybody else does either. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And you know, uh, when I teach at Penn, we always have this conversation with the students, and they're always split. Uh, yeah, like you have a course on political Islam, and uh, you couldn't convince some of the students that you know this is actually people actually believe this. You know, right. uh, some people no right. way. This is all just cynical. Everybody's always looking for the what they re the real yeah. meaning, right? Why, why is this really happening? You know, what's the economic situation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting inside somebody's, another culture, not just religiously, but any kind of other culture, uh, is, is very difficult. It's very difficult to see the world through someone else's eyes, um, who's had a very different life experience. Um, I would say that's true, uh, you know, especially true when you're dealing with foreign culture, especially in the Middle East is one of the more difficult, I think, for Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and especially because religion does play this role, and a lot of the analysts happen to be, you know, secular, you know, Westerners who, who don't look at the world in this way. Right. Question right here, and then we'll come over here. Yeah. Right there, get the microphone there from that young man there. Hi there. Um, I have a question. You used the word weaponization, and it sort of uh, reminded me of something. Um, after 91, there was more, I think, weaponization of Islam in, in Iraq because they were facing a strategic enemy who was an infidel. So, um, from your research, has that, did that play a role, a role? In other words, was the fact that the Americans in the West were sort of demonized religiously contribute afterwards to the sort of uh, negative way in which the Islamists then viewed the international involvement? Um, you mean how, how uh, Saddam and the Bathists or? No, no, Saddam and the Bathists had weaponized it yeah. because it was a main theme in their yes. contest with the West and then did it develop a life of its own after Saddam was already not there. Oh, after Saddam was not there um, and, and become, you know, morph into sort of Islamism or something like that. Well, it's certainly, uh, yeah, so there, what you see is, is, for example, in the 1990s, right, is um, there is some of that, right? Um, first of all, there are a lot of Ba'athists who uh, maybe were Islamists secretly or Salafis or something like that, but they didn't, they, they couldn't say that. But, you know, 
they just went along with bath, because you had to be a member of the bath party if you wanted to be a teacher or a police officer or something like that, and they had their own views behind closed doors. Uh, so there's that group of people. Uh, then there are other groups of people who simply don't understand what the regime is doing. Um, and you get this all the time, because uh, you see this in the Bathist records where somebody, uh, the regime is talking about religion, and they say, great, we're talking about religion, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, let's go and pray and, and talk about Islamic law and all these sort of things. And then they get arrested. And they say, like, well, what do you mean? I'm just doing a faith campaign, right? And they said, no, 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 not, not, not that type of uh, a faith campaign. So I imagine there was a lot of, of that, that, uh, you know, especially after the, after the wheels come off in 2003, it's easy for some people to sort of make this switch because, okay, well, I can sit here and talk about this and Arab intellectuals can sit there and talk about the difference between Arab nationalism and Islamism, but to the average person in the street, you know, uh, they, they don't know what this stuff is. You know, they just know you're talking about religion or you're not, or you're a good Muslim or you're not, right? Uh, and they haven't really thought through this. So, yes, does it prime some people? Certainly, uh, for, for post-2003. And that the uh, modern Middle East was the creation of the, the French and the British. Yeah. Uh, with that, re with reference to that, in, in your opinion today, do uh, Iraqis identify as Iraqis? Is there this uh, national identification? And uh, quick second question, I remember reading an article by, I think it was Eli Kaduri, which suggested that the Iraqi society as such was a more violent society than other societies in the Middle East. And the article referenced the way the king w and was disposed of in the 50s yeah. and also the way Saddam Hussein behaved. Yeah, so the first uh, part of that question is I think a popular misconception, right? Um, there was a big, a lot of articles, a lot of work on this uh, over the last couple of years because now we're at the 100 year anniversary of you know, the British and the French supposedly creating the Middle East out of nothing, just drawing empty lines on the map and all this sort of things. That has been overblown. Um, you know, the map that the, Brit the, the country of Iraq, the, the British get it, the name of it and the basic shape of the Arab, at least the Arab part, from an Ottoman map from you know, uh, the 1890s. <laughs> um, and the British knew very well. Uh, they didn't just create lines on the map. They actually knew where the tribes were uh, in these different countries, and um, you know which wells they were using, and they used the wells of these different tribes in the desert to sort of create uh, a basic line, right, uh, for um, for Iraq, um, and then that li those lines change basically from the end of World War One up until almost 1930, because there are wars with the uh, Wahhabis in, in Saudi Arabia, with the Turks uh, in the north. Uh, and they change between, you know, these lines basically move and change around uh, because of different battles and uh, diplomatic negotiations and treaties, just the same way that normal, you know, lines would, would move and change anywhere else until they settled on what they are. There's now one line, it's a very small line, uh, on the Iraqi map that was actually created by the British and the French. And it's, 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 it's very small, it's the one sort of straight line uh, in Iraq, uh, and it's out in the middle of the desert, so it really doesn't matter where, where this line is, right? Um, so that's sort of been overblown. It was overblown because it, it, it met everybody's political needs for most of the 20th century, right? Uh, it met the needs of the British officials because they could go back home and say, look what I did, right? Uh, you know, if you're, in a, if you're anytime you're reading like the, the, uh, the archives of a diplomat or some sort of government official, um, you know, they always say they did more than what they actually did, right? Because they're trying to get a promotion and the next, you know, they, they, they play it up, right? So of course, they created Iraq, right? Um, and um, it also looked good for the Arab nationalists because now they have a scapegoat. And they say, ah, oh, you know, look what they did. They, they divided us, you know, um, just drew straight lines on the map with no, no concern for who we are, right? Um, and so the question of whether or not there are people that are Iraqis today, yes. Uh, it depends on where you are, though, right? So the Kurds, we can take them out of the picture. They don't consider themselves Iraqis at all. Um, they don't consider that to be Iraq. They consider that to be a different country. But among the Sunnis and Shis, um, yes, there is a sense of Iraqiness. In fact, uh, this counter-ISIS battle, right, was fought 
by Shis against ISIS, right? And, and they go up and they lose thousands of people. Uh, and it costs them a lot of money to take back cities like Ramadi and Mosul, which are Sunni cities which have nothing to offer them, right? So if you think about this, uh, the oil and the resources in Iraq are in the Kurdish north and the Shi'i south. There's nothing out there in, in the Sunni deserts of western and northwestern Iraq that anybody wants, right? Um, so ISIS takes over, why not? Or even before ISIS, when the Sunnis were saying, we want to have our own little state. There were some Sunnis that were saying that. We want to have our own autonomy in our own state. Why not just let them, if you're a Shi? What do they have for you, other than just people who want to kill you, right? Um, so let them have it. But that's not how they thought. They thought this is part of our country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were rescuing you know, um, their countrymen from, from ISIS. Uh, and I think you know, people who want to make this case that the Shis and Sunnis don't have this sort of shared conception of Iraqiness uh, will have real trouble explaining what just happened there over the last two years and why the Shis, why some Shi from some village in, you know, outside of Najaf, you know, hundreds of miles away, decided to pick up his gun and go fight on the other part of the country. I mean, that's nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether or not Iraq is a more violent country than anywhere else, certainly uh, it has been said that that's the case. Um, <laughs> And there are uh, a lot of people who say that. I don't know. Um, there are a lot of people who, who argue against this, of course, too, and say, no, that this is just, you know, uh, it's not true, and you know, there's actually a civil discourse in Iraq. I would say the history has been violent. Whether or not that is um, something that is just baked in to the Iraqi psyche or the political system, I don't know what explains it. But uh, it's hard to argue that Iraq hasn't been violent. I mean, they had a number of coups even under the monarchy, which they replaced the governments. Then the monarchy's overthrown. You have a number of coups after that. You know, by the time Saddam comes to power, you know, he rules from 1979 to 2003, so almost a quarter century. And I think if you count, you know, the, the sanctions and the, the, the no-fly zones, which were pretty much, you know, there's always something going on. If you count those as conflict or war, uh, between his period of 1979 to, um, to 2003, I think 1979 and 1989 were the only two years he wasn't at war. Um, so it's a very, it's had a violent, and since 2003 hasn't been any better. Mm -hmm. So um, it has been very violent. Whether or not that is endemic, it's just something that's part of Iraq. I, I can't explain it. Uh, uh, I don't know if Iraq is inherently violent or not. Uh, I just know that it has been. But it has been. There you go. Tom. Sam, you've been a student of that area for many years. You just did a big study of the archives, am I correct, that were released after the war? What did you find most shocking, most uh, interesting to you that you got out of those archives? And also explain to the group where those archives came from. Oh, okay, so, uh, well, I'll do the second part first. Uh, there's a couple of sets of archives. They're, the main set of archives are actually the party archives, the main, the one, the main set that people can use. Um, they are party archives of the Ba'ath Party sectariat, which a, uh, a man named Kanan Makia, who spoke at FPRI's annual dinner a couple of years mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. um, he has a, uh, an NGO called the Iraq Memory Foundation that existed in the 1990s, and uh, for various reasons, they got along with the Bush administration. So they went in 2003 and just took everything, something like 11 million pages worth of records on everything in Iraq. And uh, they had tried to create a, uh, he was very much an optimist, you know, and he was gonna create a, pe a peace and reconciliation center in Baghdad. Uh, and that didn't really work <laughs> out. It turned out to be a kind of uh, conflict and retribution <laughs> center <laughs> because everybody wanted to come get these documents and kill whoever was spying on them, you know. Uh, and so, you know, some of the archivists, that, they moved them eventually to Hoover, uh, the Hoover archives, which is where they are now. Uh, you talk to some of the archivists out there, uh, the Iraqis, and they'll tell you how it was tough for them in Iraq so, um, because they were being chased around by Al-Qaeda and the Sadrists and, and whatnot. Um, so they came over with the documents in 2007, 2008. I think they opened up 2009, 2010, something like that for, for researchers. There's also some government files which were uh, just taken by the military. Those have all been returned. They opened up a small office in Washington, D.C. for a few years where you could actually access a very small portion of these. Uh, 
but that's run out of money now, so um, it's gone. Um, and and so the, the, the historian in me has to ask, so the documents in Hoover, were you able to actually touch them or were they, elect, or did you want, use an no. electronic format? Uh, electronic format. They have very good copies of them. Uh -huh. It's actually really difficult uh, for the historian, uh, historians in the room. It always uh, is, bro. Because you, uh, you know, Hoover Archives has a lot of archives. Mm -hmm. And I see all these other people and they have easy access to theirs. And they can, not only can they touch the documents, but they can take pictures of them and copy them and stuff like that. Uh, these, you're not allowed, because they have a lot of information about people in Iraq who didn't willingly right. give this information. Right. So they're very careful with them. And you're not allowed to actually take the documents out or to actually take copies of them. You can just sit there and take notes about these documents, mm -hmm. which is a very time-consuming process. Because you have to sit there for months at a time reading through them and, and, and taking notes uh, or copying them. So uh, what were the, some of the, the, the most, shocking. most shocking things? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, I, I think that a couple of things about Saddam and then one thing about sort of international relations. Uh, Saddam was a very violent man. He was very uh, ruthless. He would kill people, you know, didn't care, didn't bother him. I think he was probably a sociopath. Uh, but that wasn't his first inclination. He always sort of wanted to sort of get the support of people. And he would even give people second chances and third chances and fourth chances. You know, and you see them going, like for example in mosques, you know, you'd find somebody saying the wrong thing and they would remind them, hey, you know, of course you must have been mistaken because you're not supposed to say that. And you, you know, you should know that. And the person says, yeah, yeah, that's right, you're right. And then, you know, they'll come back and the person's still saying the wrong thing. And eventually, you know, this person will, will get it. But it takes a while for them to, you know, they don't just kill everybody right away. That's not their first inclination. Which I thought maybe, you know, from, some of the stories you hear about it, right? Uh, second thing is that um, he wasn't really that sectarian. Everyone always talks about him as being this, oh, he's a Sunni ruling over the Shis. That's not, that wasn't the case. Uh, and, uh, you know, he fought sectarianism sort of tooth and nail until the end, uh, which is also a huge miscalculation from the United States, right? Because if we went into Iraq thinking that Saddam is actually the person causing sectarianism, uh, and we create plans based on that idea, and we find out that actually he was the one stopping it, uh, you know, that could blow up in your face, right? So uh, that he wasn't this sort of sectarian. He didn't look at Xi's in the way that people uh, said that he did. Um, and, and, you know, that's sort of a big revelation, I think, for people who study Iraqi history or followed it. And the other thing was, um, I mean, I don't know if it's a, if it was a surprise, but, you know, there are some really interesting documents um, from the mid-1990s when the Iraqis are reaching out and have a relationship with Osama bin Laden. Uh, they lose this relationship after the mid-90s when uh, bin Laden goes to Afghanistan, but uh, this is a sort of... Still, people don't believe me when I tell them this. You know, they, they simply can't accept it, that that was actually the case, that, that they had a sort of working relationship uh, you know, with bin Laden. Um, so they had one, but they... They had one, but not when they were accused of him. Right, they, and they didn't actually do that much with him. They talked a lot. Uh -huh. uh, they talked a big deal uh -huh. uh, about creating some sort of operations against the infidels in the Holy Land and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but it seems the only thing they really did was create this sort of uh, radio station where they were broadcasting in to Saudi Arabia covertly. I don't know if a radio station could be covert, but you know, uh, underground radio or something like that. Nobody knows where it's coming from. Yeah, uh, into Saudi Arabia, things that the Saudis didn't like. Uh, but yeah. Interesting, let's go. We have a question from the back, please. So I wanna make a comment and then a real question. Um, Bernard Lewis, when he was talking about the, the 91, the invasion of Kuwait, uh, I remember we went into Kuwait and immediately got out again. He said it shouldn't have been called the Gulf War. It should have been called Kuwaitis interrupt us. <laughs> but my question is, you mentioned See, that was the, worth waiting for. That was <laughs> um, the diff that, <laughs> as you see, you made you made a profound made impression. impression. <laughs> you mentioned that the government's laws were not really always consistent with Sharia. Could you talk about some about some of the issues where they were different, where the government went its own way? Sure, I mean, there was tons, right? I mean, uh, it just wasn't based on Sharia at all. Um, so, you know, they had a sort of secular law code, I guess you could call it. Uh, 
you know, in the end of the day, the, it was the Revolutionary Command Council, which was a sort of revolutionary group that Saddam was uh, in charge of, that he was a chair of, that, that really made the binding rules for the country. But, you know, they had laws that they sort of inherited from previous, the monarchy before that, and uh, the British were there. Uh, and, you know, they could drink alcohol. You know, um, you didn't have to fast on Ramadan. I mean, um, they, yeah, there was just a lot of, of things like that. What about with women? So, yeah, what about with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the veil, with the hijab? Yeah, what so they didn't, the they didn't impose uh, the veil. Uh, they didn't impose the hijab. They, they didn't th think that, you know, they did have an interesting relationship with it because they were more traditional. So, for example, uh, the, the original uh, man who overthrows the monarchy, Qasim, right, was a, Iraqi military officer, he's more of a leftist and uh, is sort of even more of a, um, a secularist than the Ba'athists are. And so he um, actually creates a, uh, a family law code, which is outside of, of, of Sharia, right, law. He gets rid of it. And when the Ba'athists come into power, even before Saddam, they sort of say, no, we need to have at least family law should be under, under Sharia, which is a normal sort of uh, breakdown in, in the Arab world, that family law is still kind of under Sharia courts, the same way that like maybe people in the United States get married under a, you know, uh, the, the rabbis or, or a Christian you know, uh, priest or, or an Islamic uh, court uh, in, in the United States. Uh, so family law w fell under that, um, but women, it, they had a, a very, it's, people struggled with this position on, on women. On one hand, it was very paternalistic. On the other hand, you know, they, they felt that, you know, women were, were women first. They were mothers and, and, and things like that first. Um, they didn't always talk that way, but that's how they acted, right? Um, and even when they were protecting women's rights, it was done in a very paternalistic uh, manner, right? That they were protecting the women from maybe some horrible husband that she might, that, that, um, that she might have. But women could, could, could rise up you know, in the Ba'ath Party to fairly high ranks. Uh, in fact, one of the more interesting things I found was uh, by the mid-1990s, they had these sort of panels that uh, would um, approve male you know, sermon givers, what the sermon could be, right, and what could happen in the mosque. And they were actually women Ba'athists who, who sat on these panels and would tell male imams and sermon givers what they could and couldn't do. Um, so now oftentimes, you know, you come across these women because they're being kicked off of this for being, you know, something really sexist. They'll say, oh, they're, you know, they're not smart enough or, you know, they're not strong enough to, to handle this position. But they were in the position at, at some point, you know, mm -hmm. uh, before being kicked out for, you know, being too feminine or something like that. So, Sam, we've only got about a minute to go. I yep. want to give you a, a chance for a last word. Um, uh, and I want to ask you the provocative question. Do, um, does uh, secular cross-sectarian government in this region have a future? And if it does, will people, will people one day pine for the good old days of Saddam Hussein? <laughs> people are already pining for the good old days of Saddam. <laughs> there are plenty of people pining. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember actually a few years ago getting into like a, a bit of a heated conversation with a guy, a Christian mm -hmm. in, we were in Vienna of all places, and uh, he was saying how great Saddam was. And I was saying, you know, listen, I understand that things are bad, but like, you know, this guy gassed and killed a lot of people. And no, he didn't <laughs> want to hear it, right? Those are the good old days when everything was good. Um, and so, and a lot of Sunnis, you'll see it, like uh, any sort of protests against, before ISIS came, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these sort of uh, protests that were, that were leading up to that, you had people walking down the street with Saddam mm -hmm. uh, pictures. There is a sort of a moment, I guess, right now, mm -hmm. Post ISIS, there's actually a, uh, an article in, the, uh, in Foreign Affairs right now called A New Hope for Iraq. Uh, and there's been a few other um, pieces like that where people are talking about a sort of nascent, re-emerging kind of nationalism because the Sunnis realized that um, that was a bad move <laughs> going with ISIS. You know, um, this sort of wrecked the whole country. Um, and then there, the Shis sort of also, re some Shis also realized that you know, just sort of ruling by hammering the Sunnis uh, wasn't a good idea because they eventually are going to blow up. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are talking about Iraqiness again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, whether or not that will take off, I think, is a real tough question. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly, I wouldn't bet on it, but right now, the last few months have been, uh, it has the, the, the best chance that it's had in, in uh, probably a quarter century. Well, we can, so that's, that's hope for Iraq and also yeah. hope for scholars of Iraq to talk about in the future yeah. back on geopolitics with Granary. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight, but uh, uh, thank you, Sam Helfont, for joining us tonight. Uh, FPRI would especially like to thank the National Liberty Museum for hosting us and the Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg Family Foundation for the generous support of this program. Tonight's conversation is over, um, but we do have, after, on your way out, we have copies of Compulsion and Religion available for purchase. We encourage you to pick them up. Um, the conversation for tonight is over, but the conversation goes on monthly here at Geopolitics with Granary. We will be back next month, actually, to talk about the Carter administration, and uh, which had something to do with Iran and Iraq. Um, if you've enjoyed the discussion today, we ask you please to tell a friend and to bring a friend next time um, as we gather to talk about our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of Geopolitics with Granary and other events at FPRI, please visit our website, fpri.org. Follow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our iTunes channels. You can follow the host of this program as well on Twitter. I'm at Ronald Granary. Until next time, for all of us at FPRI, especially my colleagues in putting this broadcast together, Eli Gilman and Rachel Hemmler, and thank you to Sam Helfont, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <laughs>